Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Global Accessibility Awareness Day uh, legal update webinar. I'm Christina Lani, as Laura said. I'm an attorney with Seifarth Shaw. I'm based in Sacramento, California, but obviously websites are everywhere. So, so are we in terms of helping our clients uh, navigate the world of website accessibility. So thrilled to be here with you. We have a lot of ground to cover. I'm uh, more than happy to answer any questions you have. I'll try to address them as I go if possible, or perhaps at the end. And um, we do have a lot of material, so I'm gonna dive right in. You will see um, after we get through the initial legal disclaimer here. Obviously, we have to put it. I'm an attorney, uh, but this is not legal advice. This is purely an informational webinar. If you have any specific questions, uh, please, you know, feel free to reach out to the attorney with whom you regularly work, or you can reach out to me separately. Um, this is our agenda, legal overview. We're going to go through the basics, but super quickly, because odds are, you know, I know some of you are accessibility professionals with whom I've worked, you know, generally, you know, the state of the law, uh, but we're just going to do a very quick level set on that for those folks who aren't uh, up on that. We'll, again, go very quickly through what it means for a website to be accessible. Uh, DQ and consultants like DQ are the experts when it comes to the technological aspects of that, so I'll just hit the high points there. Then we'll look at at the data that we've crunched as to the numbers of lawsuits filed alleging inaccessible websites in federal courts, which is always interesting to see. Some key lawsuits and settlements, yes, including an update uh, on the recent Winn-Dixie 11th Circuit decision, and then a couple of strategies for avoiding and defending legal actions and a typical roadmap to accessibility. Diving into the legal background uh, right out of the gate. Uh, here, this slide has a list of, you know, generally what federal statutes may require accessible technologies like accessible websites. Title II of the ADA, with a, which applies to state and local governmental entities. Title III of the ADA, which is mainly what we're going to be talking about today, which applies to places of public accommodation. In other words, you know, essentially, you know, private businesses. Uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. We're talking about, you know, federal contractors, recipients of federal funding, and the federal government uh, with those laws. And of course, you know, in addition to federal laws, we have state non-discrimination laws as well in some jurisdictions, not in all. The Air Carrier Access Act and then Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act and the Medicare regulations, and then not on this slide, uh, the Communications Video Accessibility Act, the CVAA. All of those four, you know, last statutes and regulations do actually have specific requirements, as does Section 508 as well, as to website accessibility with reference to the WCAG guidelines, or as Title II and Title III do not. And that's going to be a common theme that we will see throughout today. Background on the ADA signed into law uh, in 1990 by George H.W. Bush. And obviously we've come a long way since then. When it was signed, there wasn't the concept of websites, let alone website accessibility, which is part of what has given rise to some of the litigation that we've seen since the law was you know, more focused on physical accessibility to physical places of business, as well as communication um, and reasonable modifications that would apply if you know, you're trying to access services or goods from those places of public accommodation. Again, you know, five key areas under the ADA, we're gonna be talking about Title III here, and then we'll also take a brief pause to talk about some proposed legislation that would propose to add another title to the ADA. The essentials here. This is all we're really going to talk about when we're talking about the background of the ADA because like we talked about a minute ago, since there is no standard set in Title III of the ADA that states this is how your website must look, this is what must how it must be coded, this is a standard it must meet to be considered in compliance with the ADA, we are going to look to the general principles of the ADA, and that's what plaintiffs do when they're filing lawsuits regarding website accessibility. So three main requirements under Title III of the ADA. 
First of all, having facilities, physical facilities, the storefront that are accessible to individuals with disabilities, both constructing them and maintaining them so they are accessible. Second, making reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures when necessary to ensure individuals with disabilities have equal access to public accommodations, goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations. And then third, and this is our, our main one that we're gonna be talking about today, ensure effective communication with individuals with disabilities by providing them auxiliary aids and services at no extra charge. In the regulation, auxiliary aids and services has a list of exemplar things that, that could be auxiliary aids and services that may need to be provided to ensure effective communication. One of the items listed is accessible electronic information technology, which is the category um, wherein possibly mobile apps, websites would fit. Um, there is no other mention of accessible websites or mobile apps in the ADA statute or regulation. So this is what we're generally looking at in addition to just the general principle of Title III of the ADA, which is uh, the requirement that public accommodations provide equal access to their goods and services to individuals with disabilities. If you get sued or get hit with an enforcement action, if you are a business uh, for violation of Title III of the ADA, what might you have to pay? What could a plaintiff or an agency potentially recover? Well, if it's a private plaintiff, they can recover injunctive relief, which means getting an order from a court that the entity make the website or mobile app accessible, uh, as well as they can recover their attorney's fees and costs. There are also state laws, uh, most prominently in New York and California that we see in the New York City laws as well, uh, that plaintiffs quite often allege in their complaint uh, that they have been violated. And the reason why they do this is because those state laws allow for recovery of penalties or damages in addition to the attorney's fees and costs where the ADA does not. The ADA does not allow recovery of, of fees or, or does not allow recovery of damages or penalties uh, in a private party action. If the Department of Justice, which is the administrative agency that is charged with enforcing the ADA, brings an enforcement action, it can assess penalties in currently the amount of $96,000 for a first violation of the law and $192,768,000 $768, for subsequent violation, as well as, of course, injunctive relief and potential damages to aggrieved people who have been damaged. What is a public place of public accommodation? Well, in the, the regulation, the statute, here's what it is. It is a um, an entity that is private, that affects commerce, and that falls within one of the 12 categories here. I'm not going to go through these, but we list them here because, you know, there have been lawsuits, there have been demand letters against entities that most likely would not fall within one of these categories, but they're still putting information on their websites for the public to see or digest. So that's somewhat of a question um, out there sometimes, you know, what about these entities that aren't traditional places of public accommodation? And what about entities that just have a website but aren't a physical place of business? Would they be a place of public accommodation or does it, must, does it have to be a physical place? Again, like I mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about a little bit later, that has been an issue of contention uh, between parties and in the courts. What is an accessible website? Well, you know, it's essentially one that can be used by people with various types of disabilities. Here on this slide, we give some examples, you know, for people who are blind, you need to be able to use the the web page with a screen reader. The screen reader needs to be able to read what is on the page. So the website needs to be coded to interact properly with the screen reader. Keyboard only access, audio descriptions for videos. We've seen some lawsuits about that lately. Color contrast, re text resizing for people with low vision or color blindness. Also color not, not being used as the sole method to convey information and um, captions for people who are deaf or hard of hearing are some examples. How do you know how to code your website so that people who have disabilities, such as those um, listed on the previous slide, can use the website? 
Well, you know, as we mentioned before, and we'll mention many, many times again, there is no standard in the regulation. There is no standard in the statute that says how a website must be coded to comply with the ADA. Uh, but there is this set of guidelines, our criteria into guidelines, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that were published by the World Wide Web Consortium and are constantly being improved as um, new technology and new methods of coding are developed. The most recent uh, version that's been adopted is 2.1 AA, well 2.1, there are three levels, A, AA, and AAA. In uh, June 2018, uh, 2.2 has come out, but I don't believe, and I know many people on this call can probably correct me, um, 2.2 hasn't been formally adopted unless I'm a little behind the time there. Uh, but anyway, we still are seeing in the lawsuits um, either plaintiffs and, you know, in discussions, the standard being pointed to as 2.0 AA or 2.1 AA. And the few court decisions we've had that have actually said, you know, business, you need to conform your website to X standard, they have pointed to the WCAG 2.0 AA criteria. So the background here. These slides, I think, will be available after the fact, so I'm not going to go into these things now because we've talked about them before, and frankly, it's old news, but it's still relevant to talk about because what's old may be new again. Um, you know, we have now the Biden administration uh, taking over from the Trump administration. It's entirely likely that the Biden administration might bring back some of what was going on during the Obama administration. So as I think all of you know, you know, we sat through a six-year period of are we going to get regulations from the DOJ stating this is what it means for a website to be compliant with the ADA? You know, what standard does it have to meet? How much businesses, how much time would businesses have to comply with any new regulations? Um, what to do about third party content, all sorts of things. And so we waited and waited and waited. There was an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. There was a supplemental advance notice of proposed rulemaking and um, still no regs. All the while, the Obama Department of Justice enforcement arm was pursuing enforcement actions against entities and had entered into quite a few settlement agreements. And it also filed um, either, you know, position statements or had, you know, filed other uh, briefs in pending legal action stating its opinion on the issue. And then we had the Trump DOJ come in and the Trump DOJ withdrew the website accessibility rulemaking effort. So there went the hopes of having any regulations. It also stopped you know, the activity that the prior DOJ had been engaged in in terms of weighing in on its opinion in pending litigation of um, website accessibility. And it also, in response to letters from at least two different groups of people from Congress, um, one senators, you know, one representatives, where those Congress people were saying, come on, DOJ, do something, you know, enact regulations, provide some certainty. The DOJ, you know, responded, no thanks, you know, we think that you should do this Congress. And so, you know, we're left with where we are, which is a lot of litigation and no regulations and no statute with guidance on this issue yet. There was a last legislative session, and now again, this late, late legislative session in Congress, uh, a bill introduced called the Online Accessibility Act that would create a new title of the ADA. Remember the titles I put up on the slide early on, and the new title would be applicable to consumer facing websites and mobile apps. It would say that the law would be satisfied if the website or app substantially complies with WCAG level A and AA or any subsequent iteration. It would make an alternative means of access also accessible and would direct the US Access Board which is the same entity that you know has developed the physical uh, ADA standards to develop regulations addressing what substantial compliance means, what alternative means of access means, what consumer facing website or mobile application mean. Um, and then it would also have some notice and administrative exhaustion requirements for private party suits, which is where we'll probably see a lot of opposition and probably see the bill 
unless it's substantially amended, meet the same fate it did last session, which is not going much of anywhere. So that's the statutory basis, the regulatory basis, the state of the law. Then we've got the lawsuits and we've all heard of all of the lawsuits. How many lawsuits are there? Well, there are some other entities that have you know, crunched some data and put out data as well, but this is the data that we've crunched every year since 2013 now. The data that we prepare is based upon lawsuits filed in federal courts only. So keep that in mind. It does not include lawsuits filed in state courts. It does not include demand letters. And there are a lot that fall in both of those categories. But the reason why we don't include those numbers is because we can reliably pull and track the federal court lawsuit filings because it's all electronic filing um, and all fairly consistent, whereas the data just wouldn't be reliable um, on state court filings and then you know, demand letters would just be purely anecdotal. So here's the data we have. As you can see, we've had steady increase, you know, pretty much every year since 2013. And this is all ADA Title III lawsuits filed, not just website accessibility on this slide from January 1st, 2013 to December 31st, 2020. So in 2013, there were about 2,700 lawsuits filed um, in federal courts alleging violation of Title III of the ADA. In 2019, there were 11,000 such lawsuits, which was a 9% increase over the prior year. And then in 2020, there were just under 11,000 lawsuits, which was a 1% decrease from the number of lawsuits filed in 2019, which we actually think is pretty significant considering the courts were closed essentially for a couple months or completely slowed with, um, you know, shutting down the economy, you know, working from home, all of that adjustment, and just with people adjusting as well. We just didn't see nearly as many lawsuits filed. As you'll see in a minute, that has significantly changed since then. The, this slide talks about the state by state numbers we have for ADA Title III website access, or sorry, not website accessibility, ADA Title III lawsuits filed on all bases. Again, so physical accessibility, sign language interpreters, service animals, um, other types of effective communication, all sorts of ADA Title III lawsuits. California, and this is just um, January 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. California led the pack with 5,869 such lawsuits. New York followed with about half, uh, 2,238 such lawsuits, followed by Florida with 1,200 lawsuits. And then we have Texas and Georgia, each with you know about 250, 285. Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Colorado we're all in the hundreds and then New Jersey and Massachusetts round out the top 10 with each under a hundred such lawsuits. This slide talks about website lawsuits specifically. So some of these lawsuits may also have allegations of a mobile app not being accessible, uh, but what we track in terms of the, the search terms we use is primarily for websites. There was a whole nother chunk of lawsuits filed purely alleging uh, inaccessible mobile apps. This data we have here is just going to lawsuits alleging an inaccessible website that might have also alleged an inaccessible mobile app along with it in that same lawsuit. Again, we're talking just federal courts across the United States, not state courts, not demand letters. In 2017, there were 814 such lawsuits filed. 2018, that number jumped 177% up to 2258. In 2019, there was a 0.01 decrease. Uh, we had two fewer lawsuits filed for 2256 in 2019. And then in 2020, last year, we saw a 12% increase from 2019. So 2,523 website accessibility lawsuits filed in 2020 in federal courts, which going back to that first slide we saw means that we must have seen fewer lawsuits filed on other bases under the under Title III in 2020, like, you know, restaurants were closed, retailers were closed. So maybe we were seeing fewer physical accessibility lawsuits. 
This slide's super interesting because it shows the state by the month by month numbers. Uh, the next one we'll look at is states. This one is month by month filings in 2020. Uh, January 2020 started out with 187 such website accessibility lawsuits filed in federal court, dipped to 174 in February, dipped to 167 in March dropped to 62 lawsuits in April, right kind of in the, the midst of lockdown, and then increased to 119 in May, 150, 150 in June, 269 in July, 300 in August, down to 274 in September, up to 293 in October, down to 228 in November, and then up to 299 in December. Those 300, 290, 299 counts are some of the highest we've ever seen in a single month. So, you know, not only did they recover um, in terms of the number of filings that, that plaintiffs were making from that April drop, you know, they, they really recovered and tried to make up for a lot of lost time there. State by state in 2020, website accessibility lawsuits. Remember the slide we looked at a couple of minutes ago where we were looking at Title III lawsuits filed on all bases and California pretty much blew every other state out of the water. New York takes the cake on website accessibility lawsuits filed in federal courts. It had 1,694 such lawsuits in 2020. The next closest state was Florida with 302 lawsuits. So my math off the top of my head is not great and I didn't crunch this number before, but that's a heck of a lot more. That's exponentially you know, higher, uh, the 16, almost 1,700 over the 300. Uh, the next state was California with 223, then Pennsylvania with 173 followed by Colorado with 40, Illinois 32, Massachusetts 24, Connecticut 11, and Georgia and Indiana, both in single digits, rounding out the top 10. Note that in California, we see a lot of cases filed in state courts, and we see a heck of a lot of demand letters. So that might be a good part of the reason why those numbers are, are quite different there between the two. Um, also note that in Florida, that is the state where we saw a lot of the mobile app only lawsuits filed and those were in the low hundreds uh, last year. So jumping in to the case law here and I'm just checking a couple of questions here and I think Cool, somebody confirmed 2.2 is still a working draft. So thank you so much for confirming that. And some are saying, you know, we're, we're looking at probably this summer for that. And the couple of other questions we'll hopefully get to at the end. I'll dive into the case law now. So some, we're just gonna hit the highlights here. You know, there's there's been cases that have come out over the years and we've talked about those over the years. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot in 2020 in part because the courts were closed, but some of the decisions that did come out either in 2020 or 2021 were fairly significant. So we're going to focus on those today. So the first case, after I just said all that, it goes back to 2019, but it's one of the few appeals court decisions from the federal courts that we have. And uh, in this case, they asked the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, to review the decision in the Supreme Court said no. So th this case is very significant for that reason. And this is a case you all know, I know, the Robles versus Domino's pizza case. The Ninth Circuit issued its decision on uh, the appeal from the federal trial court in 2019. And what had happened in the Domino's case was the federal trial court had granted um, an early dispositive motion, you know, so before discovery, before they'd gotten into figuring out the facts of the case, really. And the early dispositive motion was brought on due process and primary jurisdiction grounds. So the defendant was was arguing essentially uh, there is no standard set for what a website must look like, how it must be coded to comply with the ADA, and it's the DOJ's job to do that, so you can't determine this case court until the DOJ has acted first. They have primary jurisdiction, 
and it's a violation of our due, due process rights to hold us to some standard that isn't set in any statute or regulation yet. And the Ninth Circuit said, no, 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 no. It is our job to fill gaps in the law all the time, to interpret the law where it is there to be interpreted. And we think that there is enough in the ADA that we can interpret an issue of whether a website that is not accessible violates the ADA. The Ninth Circuit said that the ADA applies to websites and mobile apps that have a nexus to a physical place of business. That's significant because we don't have a whole lot of decisions from courts, let alone uh, from a court of this level. So, you know, an appeals court in the federal court system, whatever this court holds, courts in the Ninth Circuit have to follow that ruling. And the Domino's case just dealt with a website. So it's significant that the court also talked about the ADA applying to mobile apps. Um, the Again, you know, the court said Domino's had general notice of the general requirements of ADA Title III, and therefore uh, the due process and primary jurisdiction arguments weren't going to fly. What was also significant was the question of whether an alternative means of communication could be an equally effective alternative means of effective communication to therefore comply with the ADA's effective communication requirement, even if the website wasn't accessible. And the court here said, we can't decide that at this point because that's going to be an issue of fact. You know, was the website or was the telephone service available in the same manner and means as the website would have been so that people could have an equally affected alternative means of access and we would need to develop the facts more to understand that. So the appeals court remanded uh, the case back down to the trial court said, you know, move along with with discovery and litigation. Domino's appealed to the US Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court said no we don't want to review the case uh, in 2019 in October. So that case was left to proceed. In the meantime, we had been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the decision in the Gill versus Win Dixie case. The Gill versus Win Dixie case was a bench trial verdict. It's one of the only cases that we've seen on website accessibility go to a trial. And the trial court ruled that Win Dixie's website was not accessible and violated the ADA. It issued an injunction, a three year long injunction that required, as you can see on the, the lower part of the slide here, um, that an access that the website be made accessible within a, a relatively short period of time to the WCAG 2.0 level AA standard, that employees be trained annually on website accessibility, that third party content be accessible, which was extremely significant because it's the only word from anyone, be it an administrative agency or a court on that point at that time and uh, a website accessibility policy that Winn-Dixie adopt one and that Winn-Dixie pay fees and costs totaling $100,000 to the plaintiff, which is actually a fairly so sum, low sum for a case going all the way to trial, but this case went you know, fairly quickly to trial. The appeals court, after having heard oral argument on the appeal in 2018, right around, I forget if it was right before or right after, the Ninth Circuit heard oral argument in the Domino's case. So the Domino's case, the Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit issued its decision in 2019. Two years later, we finally got earlier this year and a, a decision from the 11th Circuit on this case. And in this case, the 11th Circuit went the opposite way and it overturned the bench trial verdict for the plaintiff, remanded the case down to the trial court. And the court here found that websites are not places of public accommodation under Title III of the ADA and that when Dixie's website did not pose an intangible barrier to Gill's ability to access the physical store. In other words, everything that that could be done on the website needed to be completed in the physical store anyway. So the website did not pose a barrier to Gill's ability to access the goods and services of the Winn-Dixie store. 
Immediately thereafter, a petition for rehearing of that decision uh, with a full panel of the 11th Circuit was filed. Um, and in that petition, they're arguing that the decision is contrary to 11th Circuit precedent um, or, you know, United States Supreme Court. The, uh, they said that the majority discarded the 11th Circuit's nexus standard and um, that the court's comparison of blind users to a sighted customer who does not have internet access was inconsistent with 11th Circuit precedent. Um, really, you know, the, the petition said that the proper analysis would be different treatment of individuals with disabilities under the ADA and the provision of auxiliary aids and services for effective communication. So looking specifically as to whether individuals with disabilities were treated differently, that's one analysis the court should have conducted rather than comparing uh, individual blind users to a sighted customer who doesn't have internet access. And then that the court also should have done an analysis as to whether auxiliary aids and services were provided for effective communication. The petition also said that the majority opinion in the 11th Circuit ruling should not have decided, which essentially set new precedent, you know, an 11th Circuit decision is something that all of the trial courts in the 11th Circuit have to follow that websites are not places of public accommodation, because that's not an issue that the trial court decided. And as to the three-year injunction, you know, they, they said, well, the appeal essentially was moot because a three-year injunction already expired. So uh, I haven't checked it. I didn't get a chance to check right before this webinar, uh, but we'll check the docket and see if there's been any progress on that um, as to the status of this petition for rehearing. But that's where we are in Winn-Dixie. We'll see if the appeals court decision um, stands or not. A lot of companies are asking us, well, what does that mean? When Dixie totally changes the landscape, doesn't it? And it, it really doesn't because there was already a split in the circuits between, you know, what is the standard that has to be met? Is it that there must be a nexus to a physical place of business for a website to be subject to Title III of the ADA? Is it that web only businesses? can be subject to Title III of the ADA? Is it something in between? And it really varies depending on what court you are in. So, you know, and, and websites are everywhere, right? So we see the same businesses with the same websites getting sued in different courts across the country where different rules apply. So we'll continue to watch it though, but for now, I mean, unless you're in the 11th circuit or you're sued in the 11th circuit or in district court in Florida, um, it doesn't make a whole lot of change. And even in Florida right now, we just need to watch it and see how it eventually comes out. Some other key cases, the Mexico versus Alba web designs case here, one out of the Western District of Virginia from January of this year uh, is another interesting one because here uh, in contrast to the Domino's case, you know, where remember again in the Ninth Circuit, that's a physical nexus, um, physical nexus circuit. So all the courts in that circuit have to follow, you know, if there's a nexus to a physical place of business, a website can be subject to Title III of the ADA. In the Western District of Virginia, the federal court said web only businesses are subject to the ADA, which is consistent with other courts uh, in the Northeast as well. And um, it said, you know, that places of public accommodation are not limited to physical brick and mortar establishments and instead include commercial websites that offer goods and services. This follows the precedent in the First Circuit or other cases that have been decided in the First Circuit. And um, the court noted that it applies with equal force in the modern world of e-commerce, which has been compounded by the pandemic. The court um, denied a, a, a motion for judgment on the pleadings, which is essentially, you know, the, the defendant saying, you know, court, you should dismiss this case um, on the basis of this and on the basis that the defendant had argued that there's no likelihood that the plaintiff might be injured in the future. That's essentially one aspect of standing. And the court said, no, you know, we're going to deny those motions. We think that there is potentially a claim here because 
a web only business, it can be subject to the ADA in this court in the Western District of Virginia. The Thurston versus Midvale case, uh, the Whisper Lounge case, is one that we've been talking about a couple for a couple of years now. It came out of the California uh, state court system, not the federal courts like we've been talking about through most of this presentation. But it is worth mentioning because we do see a lot of website accessibility cases in California. And Cal this is one of the few we've seen anywhere where we've actually gotten and a decision on you know, either the merits or um, here, summary judgment means that both parties submitted briefs after discovery that had here are what the undisputed facts are, your honor. We don't need to go to trial on this because we think that on these facts that nobody disputes, there's nothing for a you know, finder of fact to decide. So you court can decide the motion. So in this case, there was a summary judgment motion, which is what I just told you it is, uh, again, the restaurant, the Whisper Lounge. Um, I'm sorry, the appeals court affirmed a summary judgment against the restaurant. Um, so the plaintiff filed the summary judgment motion here on the grounds that an inaccessible website discriminates against the blind customer under California's UNRRA Act. Under the UNRRA Act, a plaintiff can recover damages like we talked about earlier in the amount of either $4,000 minimum statutory damages or actual damages. So here the court ordered that the plaintiff be paid $4,000 in statutory damages and um, obviously the attorney's fees and costs as well and that the website be conformed with the WCAG level 2.0 AA and the, you know, this was what the trial court had ordered. The appeals court affirmed that and the appeals court found that ordering the website to conform to that standard is not overbroad, nor is it uncertain. That's been something that some defendants have argued that the WCAG criteria are either overbroad as they might apply to a website or they're uncertain in the way they can be interpreted. And the California appeals court here said, no, we, we disagree with that. The appeals court also held that websites with a physical nexus, you know, so here consistent with the Ninth Circuit holding, even though the state court system is different, and there have been different rulings even in California state courts on this issue. Uh, so this court, though, held that websites with a physical nexus are subject to Title III. As to third party content, remember when Dixie was one of the only cases that talked about third party content and its, you know, status is uncertain right now. Uh, in this case, the court held that, um, you know, maybe a website, a business with a website can be liable for third party content on the website. Specifically, the court said that the appellant, meaning the restaurant, offered no legal support for a theory that it cannot be liable for discrimination if it hires someone else to do the discrimination. Essentially, if you're hiring someone to put content on your website and it's not accessible, so you're not providing equal access to that information on the website, then this court seemed to indicate, you know, you should be responsible for that content. And the effective communication via an alternative means of access concept here, the court held that telephone and email were not and effective alternate means of communication because they were only available during restaurant hours of operation. Whereas, you know, folks who could use the website would be able to go on the website, you know, 24 seven, presumably to conduct whatever business they wanted. Um, and, you know, folks who could not use the website could not use telephone service during those same times. Jumping back to the present, to another more recent case, uh, January case again, 2021. This one out of the Southern District of Indiana Federal Court. Uh, this one, you know, was not on the merits, unlike the case we just talked about. This is one where a motion for default judgment was granted. And what that means is the plaintiff filed a lawsuit, a complaint in court. The defendant did not respond to the lawsuit. And after a period of time, what the court does is they will grant a default judgment, meaning that the defendant failed to appear to defend itself. So by default, the plaintiff wins. 
And in granting this default judgment, the court found that the allegations in the complaint were sufficient to state a claim against the web only business that um, the under the Seventh Circuit, which, you know, generally um, this court is in Indiana is looking to uh, followed guidance from the Seventh Circuit in finding that Title III applies to websites without a nexus to a physical space. So here we're talking about web only businesses subject to Title III. It ordered to the defendant to bring the website into compliance with the ADA and its implementing regulations within 90 days and that failure to achieve full compliance within 90 days would result in a permanent shutdown of the offending website. Now, this obviously seems, seems pretty extreme by any measure, um, even more extreme when we know that the defendant didn't even show up to defend itself in this lawsuit. The court denied the plaintiff's request, however, and granted this is something we see in a lot of complaints. We see the plaintiffs requesting all sorts of different relief, you know, adopt a policy, um, engage a vendor to help you with the website accessibility, uh, put an accessibility statement up, train employees, all of those things. Sometimes we see a whole long list in the complaint. Um, and here the court said, uh, we're not going to order the defendant to conform the website to the WCAG. We're not going to order the plaintiff is a, allowed to monitor defendant's compliance and get fees spent in doing that monitoring. We're not going to order that the defendant retain a specific consultant here, and we're not going to order that defendant adopt any policies or practices that go beyond compliance with the ADA, because essentially none of those things are required by the ADA. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is as well, right, that the court did order that the website be brought into compliance with the ADA. So then it's a matter of interpretation with, okay, what does that mean to be in compliance with the ADA? Most experts are going to be looking to the WCAG guidelines as a measure for whether a website is accessible and, you know, therefore, as an accessible website, you know, whether it complies with the ADA. Extreme facts, but it's worth noting the outlier cases like this. This case is old news now, but I always mention it because it has some interesting points that are relevant today still. This is the DOT versus Scandinavian airline system case. It was brought under the Air Carrier Access Act which you know only applies to airlines it doesn't apply to most businesses and it actually requires that airline websites be brought into conformance with the WCAG AA criteria by 2016. Uh, the principles that it's useful for though are that here the defendant did not make its website accessible. It built a secondary assistive site that met the WCAG guidelines. And even though that is specifically prohibited under the Air Carrier Access Act and is not specifically prohibited nor even mentioned in the ADA, it is a principle that plaintiffs, that advocacy groups have been adamantly opposed to for a very long time. And I haven't heard it as much lately, but we had for a very long time um, you know, beginning questions from businesses saying, well, can we just do a separate website that is accessible? And, you know, this is something that, you know, is thought of, of you know, separate but equal is not equal. Um, over time, the accessible website will be kind of forgotten and not maintained while the separate inaccessible website is. So for various reasons, it's thought of as just being a very bad idea. So it's, it's worth noting that um, even though it's not expressly prohibited by Title III of the ADA, it's still not a great idea uh, for many reasons. And the other little point to take away from this case is the use of a widget or an overlay product. I'm not going to get into that can of worms today, but um, it was an issue in this case, and it is a very um, hot topic right now, and you can Google it and read all about that separately. Physical nexus. We have talked about physical nexus ad nauseum, so I am not in the interest of time and boring you all going to talk about it anymore. Uh, these cases or these slides on this case, which again, you know, the slides will be provided to you after. 
uh, talk about a couple of more recent cases on the physical nexus topic. Um, you know, one out of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, where the motion to dismiss was granted because there was no physical nexus. Uh, and then we have two out of California state courts, um, one where another appeals court in California held that websites with a physical nexus um, where customers go um, to a physical place of business where customers go are covered by Title III of the ADA. The trial, that one's significant because the trial court um, held the opposite and had dismissed the case on that basis. And then another one out of Los Angeles County Superior Court in March of 2021, where again, kind of extreme facts, the court here granted a motion to dismiss an UNRRA Act claim, the California equivalent of the ADA, on the basis that digital spaces are not places of public accommodation within a, a nexus to some physical place. Um, and so again, just an outlier there that shows that even, you know, different courts within a state, within a, you know, district are holding very different things as to even this sort of fundamental issue of does a web only business have to be accessible under Title III of the ADA and equivalent state laws? Does there have to be a physical nexus, et cetera? Mootness. Mootness is an issue that comes up when you want to argue, hey court, the ADA only allows for recovery of injunctive relief. It only requires that um, I fix the website, that I make the website accessible if it is not. And if my website is accessible, then there's no claim for a violation of Title III of the ADA, nor should a, a case per proceed for a violation of Title III of the ADA because a court can't order me to do anything that's not already been done. So that's essentially what mootness is about. And we had a case from 2019, uh, Diaz versus Kroger in the Southern District of New York, where a lawsuit was dismissed as moot based on a declaration that Kroger submitted stating that all the barriers raised in the complaint, the lawsuit, were fixed it ensured that no additional barriers existed and it was committed to access going forward. There have been other cases, however, in different courts where uh, the court has held that no, websites are dynamic. You know, even if you're claiming the website's accessible today, it can change tomorrow and then the, the lawsuit's no longer moot. So we're not going to dismiss the case on mootness grounds. So again, the mootness argument is going to be very fact and very case specific, but you can look at some of these cases that we have here, uh, both the Diaz case, and we're going to talk about the Rizzi case in a minute, for examples of if you're going to make a mootness argument, you want to make sure that you have the policies and procedures in place that uh, you follow to maintain the website so that it, it is maintained in an accessible fashion, as well as, you know, preferably a declaration from a reputable digital accessibility consultant that says we looked at the website and, you know, in our professional opinion, it, you know, is fully accessible in conformance with, you know, the WCAG criteria. In the Haynes versus Hooters uh, case, which we had the second one on the slide here, this is one where there was a prior settlement with another plaintiff and the district court dismissed the lawsuit on that basis. The 11th Circuit reversed that by and said essentially that Hooters was only in the process of making the website accessible. It hadn't finished its accessibility work yet, so the case was not moot. And um, there was also different relief requested in the, in the prior settlement as well. So kind of, you know, fact-specific case there also. Um, the Walters versus Simply Skinny Ties case um, out of the Northern District of New York from the end of the year in 2020 is one where a mootness motion was denied because the court found that there was an ongoing factual dispute over whether um, you know, the de defendant's claim, which the defendant even backed up with, with declarations, that it had already made all reasonable modifications to the website and that it had already remedied all the ADA violations and ensured no additional barriers to accessing the website exist. Um, there was an, a factual dispute as to whether the defendant did, in fact, remedy the alleged violations and whether the violations were likely to recur. So again, you know, that's 
And one of those cases where the court was saying, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I believe you that, that you know, you really have mooted out the case that the accessibility issues really have been resolved. Contrast that with the August 2020 decision in Hilton versus Rizzi out of the Eastern District of New York, where the court found on the mootness uh, topic that the Hilton, because the Hilton had submitted evidence, and this one was a declaration from Kathy Walden, and the plaintiff did not submit any evidence to contradict this. So again, that's a key fact, right? If the plaintiff had submitted evidence contradicting the Kathy Walden declaration, we might have had a different outcome here. Uh, but the evidence that the Hilton submitted said that a blind or evidenced that a blind person could use a screen reader to find a hotel room and make a reservation on the website. And since in the, in the lawsuit complaint, the plaintiff had claimed the barriers prevented him from making a reservation, I'm uh, saying, well, you know, this, this expert says that, you know, you could do what you claim you couldn't do on the website and that those functionalities were accessible to you. And um, so that uh, the Hilton prevailed on that basis, on that argument. Standing issues are, oops, as I went one slide too far, standing issues are quite often raised as well. We haven't been seeing them as frequently, but the standing argument essentially says that the court should dismiss the lawsuit because the plaintiff doesn't have standing to pursue the lawsuit, either because he couldn't or she couldn't actually, you know, use the goods or services of the business that he or she were trying to use, that there's no possibility that there could have been any injury as a result, therefore, nor is there likelihood that the plaintiff could be injured in the future. And most of those arguments that are successful are when there was no possibility that the plaintiff could use the website or the services that the website provides, like in the example of, as we have on the slide here, credit union cases, where you either have to be a member of the armed services or of a, a you know, federal agency to even be a member of that credit union in the first place, and the plaintiff you know, wasn't in the armed services or wasn't um, a, an employee of you know, that agency. So pretty fact specific there as well. Captioning cases, the Harvard and MIT cases, you know, are a year, um, two years in terms of the settlements old now. The cases had been going on for years before that. But we like to point these out because there aren't a lot of captioning decisions. There have been more and more captioning, and as I mentioned, some audio description cases filed. Um, but not many decisions on that basis. So when we're talking about captioning, these are the most prominent lawsuits and um, we wanna keep you know, the fact that you need to make sure that if you're going to conform to the WCAG guidelines, it's not all about um, individuals who might have um, vision related disabilities. It's also hearing related disabilities, you know, mobility disabilities, cognitive disabilities, et cetera. And to, wrap it up in our concluding slides, some strategies for avoiding and defending litigation, create and maintain the website and mobile app so that they are accessible, potentially have a 24 seven telephone line to have that alternative means of effective communication that we talked about earlier, have an accessibility statement, have an accessibility policy and procedure. Um, in addition to just, you know, helping your company, your business know what it needs to do internally, know what your internal policy is to create and maintain an accessible website. It's a you know, great tool if you have to defend a lawsuit and the accessibility statement gives folks a way to reach out to you if they are having difficulty using the website. Train, train, train. Anybody who touches the website, who develops, who changes code, who adds content, who changes content, customer service representatives, anyone who's going to be interacting uh, with the public. Take care with your vendor contracts and any third party content that you're providing on the website for the reasons we talked about before. And I put consent decree up here in question marks because uh, a lot of companies have decided to enter into a consent decree, which essentially is a settlement that you ask a court to approve. And then you're under a court order to comply with the terms of the settlement rather than it being a public settlement agreement. Um, and that's a strategy that some companies have decided to employ to mitigate risk of future suits as well. Challenges, 
link to third party websites, you know, have that speed bump is kind of the best practice there. Third party content on your website. Um, we've talked about that in the context of various cases today. And then what about social media? And um, the, really the only word we have on social media is from the Title II Supplemental Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking from way back in 2015, 2016. And, um, you know, there essentially the DOJ said, you know, if you're going to put content on social media and you don't have control over the, the accessibility of the platform, make sure that the content is provided someplace else and is accessible in that someplace else. Again, that, you know, statement doesn't really have any force or effect of law, but it's one of the only few pieces of guidance we have on it. Typical roadmap to accessibility, get help, qualified accessibility counsel, qualified digital accessibility expert, do your due diligence, do your homework. Um, having qualified help in both of those areas will save you so much time and money. Privilege issues, going back to having accessibility counsel in place. Don't just do automated testing, don't just use a tool, you know, manual testing as well um, is an important facet of your accessibility program. Train, 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 we talked about that ad nauseum. Um, making the accessibility improvements to a website and mobile app, make sure you prioritize, otherwise it can be so overwhelming to your teams. Periodically re-audit, um, maintain your internal policies and procedures and train your folks on them so they follow them and have a mechanism to receive and act upon user feedback regarding accessibility and make sure that you know your email box, your telephone is, um, is man, woman, person uh, answered and so you can respond to folks promptly and effectively. So with that, um, I know we have two minutes left, it, I, and this is on the last slide here, I have our blog website, www.adatattle3, which is three eyes, I, 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 dot com. We have our blog about our statistics up there, our blog about Winn-Dixie, all of that if you want to go see more. Um, I'm seeing we have two minutes, and I can scroll through the questions real quick. Um, we have one question about penalty limits. The, the penalty limits on the early slide, those are under the Title III of the ADA, and um, they are set by the law. So you can get those current uh, penalties if you could go back and look at that slide on the damages. I don't know offhand in New York if there's any upper limit on damages, um, nor are there in California. It's either 4,000 per occurrence or actual damages if someone actually suffered actual damages there. Um, what else? Were there any others that you saw, Laura, that we should address in the last minute here? Let me take a look here. Is there any case law um, offering guidance on audio description and whether it's required under Title II or Title III of the ADA? There is some case law on audio description and there are some settlement agreements um, uh, on audio description. I think the NFB website is the easiest source for those uh, settlements. Um, and I know, I mean, DQ actually might even have a blog or two on the topic as well. There's not a whole lot on it, but but there is a little bit on it, yes. Great. Um, to the person who asked about the slides, we will be sending those out by email. Uh, another question here, how effective is a BPAT in protecting a company from litigation? Ooh, that's a complicated one. Um, it's gonna be pretty highly fact specific there. Um, yeah, I guess I can't really say more than that um, as it, it depends on what the VPAT says and really it comes down to what the state of accessibility of the website is. It's, it, you know, a VPAT is not going to provide any kind of de facto protection against a lawsuit or defense in a lawsuit. Great. Um, another question here is how, um, how enforceable is it, is this to software um, versus a website um, and whether they're subject to the same litigation? Um, not sure I understand that question. Um, if it's just software that someone would use, then you know it would be a product rather than a means through which 
a business is offering its goods or services or communicating about its goods or services. So it might not be subject to Title III, but that again is gonna be kind of a fact specific question there as to what we're exactly talking about. Um, and I guess I would say, you know, I, I can see we're at time here and I'm sure you all have other things to jump to. So if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to reach out to Laura, reach out to me and we can try to touch base with you separately. Definitely. And um, I wanna thank you again, Christina, really great job, really great content. Um, we're so thankful to have you to uh, kick off our Global Accessibility Awareness Days activities. So thank you again, and I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.